Leaders of Australia and the UK met President Joe Biden this week to formally announce their submarine partnership, which goes by the acronym AUKUS, A-U-K-U-S. The impact will be felt across the Indo-Pacific. A pact aimed at pushing back on China's military expansion. Three old democracies engaging in a new deal to counter Chinese ambitions in the Indo-Pacific. AUKUS has one overriding objective, to enhance the stability of the Indo-Pacific amid rapidly shifting global dynamics. And the United States could not ask for two better friends or partners to stand with as we work to create a safer, more peaceful future for the people everywhere. I'm proud to be your shipmates. Thank you. The AUKUS Pact will see the US, Britain and Australia create a new fleet of nuclear-powered submarines using cutting-edge technology. Australia will also get to buy up to five of its first nuclear-powered subs from the US. Unsurprisingly, the deal has angered China. Beijing warned on Tuesday that the three countries were treading a path of error and danger and has accused them of stoking tensions and reverting to a Cold War mentality. But China has been ramping up its own rhetoric and its military muscle. The People's Congress just approved a sharp increase in defence spending, with President Xi Jinping stressing the need to protect China's interests and national security. We must fully promote the modernization of national defence and the armed forces and build the People's Army into a great wall of steel that effectively safeguards national sovereignty, security and development interests. As China takes a more aggressive stance towards Taiwan and in the South China Sea, the US has been holding military drills with its allies in the region. Joint air, land and sea exercises with countries like Japan, Thailand and South Korea are a show of solidarity at a time of heightened tensions. Tensions that are forcing many countries in the region to reassess the balance between their security and their economic ties with China. Joining us from Singapore is Blake Herzinger, a research fellow at the United States Study Center. Thanks for coming on the program. Um, Blake, we're coming to you in Southeast Asia. Our report mentioned Thailand there, participating in military exercises with the U.S. Uh, but, for example, I understand Thailand has also considered buying submarines manufactured by China. Uh, it underscores to me the challenge for Southeast Asia, walking this line Talk about that. Absolutely. It's a delicate balance for Southeast Asia. There's no country that does not feel this tension between, you know, two superpowers and a rising China in the region. Um, and, and with regard to defense equipment, at times in the past, some states have chosen to go with Chinese equipment simply because the price point was right and maybe American gear was on the overly sophisticated side or overly intricate and expensive. Now, the U.S. and other countries often talk about a free and open Indo-Pacific. I've always wondered, what does that actually mean? I think there's a lot of people that wonder what that means. And I think if you look at the various states that have come up with free and open Indo-Pacific strategies, the understanding or the, the definition varies a bit between capitals. But I think among partners uh, like the U.S., Japan, Australia, where you see the, the similarity in those concepts is on the focus on uh, rules that everyone accepts and that govern the region. So everyone can participate in regional architectures so long as they follow those rules. And then states within the region are free to choose their partners within the region. No one is excluded. Uh, international law governs. And that's where we've seen sort of a divergence from Beijing uh, over time, particularly in Southeast Asia, with efforts to box out the United States and dissuade Southeast Asian partners from cooperating with the United States. Uh, you were an officer with the U.S. Navy and still in the reserves, I believe. Explain in basic terms Chinese naval power in Asia versus the U.S., U.K. and Australia. Absolutely. And, and let me preface this with, you know, these are certainly my my views and, and comments and not in any way reflective of U.S. Navy policy or, or the U.S. government's stand on these issues. Um, but 
the Chinese Navy has undergone a monumental change in its in its composition, its size, and its sophistication over the last 20 years. So the People's Liberation Army Navy, as it's known, has invested heavily in uh, in large, very capable surface combatants, uh, amphibious warfare vessels similar to those operated by the United States, nuclear submarines, both nuclear-powered and nuclear-armed, as well as now aircraft carriers. We're seeing finishing touches on, on a new class of carrier that incorporates similar technology to those in the U.S. force. Uh, so what we're seeing is a modern Navy, hulls that are far, far newer than those in the, the three navies you mentioned, the United States, the, the Royal Australian Navy, and the Royal Navy. So the average age of a Chinese ship is actually far newer than most of those in the West. Um, and in, in size, you know, in terms of hull count, the, the PLAN, as it's known, has already surpassed the U.S. Navy. It, it dwarfs the RAN, the Royal Australian Navy, and the Royal Navy. Um, the RAN's around 50 ships, and the Royal Navy's around 75. Uh, about one-third to maybe just under a half of those are actual battle force ships, the, the kind that would be you know, firing missiles or launching aircraft, and the rest would be auxiliaries, oilers, supply vessels, mine hunting ships. Uh, so you're really dealing with a a huge regional navy and an incredible buildup um, in the region that has prompted significant discomfort among uh, regional states. Blake Herzinger, thank you so much for joining us.